When I was in elementary school, my family, we lived in the Philippines as missionaries. And, um, you know, I remember one day at dinner, my dad, um, he met eyes with my mom, and she kind of was like, in kind of one of these things. And so after dinner, he said, hey, Rob, follow me to the living room. And we sat in the living room, and he asked me, he said, Rob, do you have a relationship with Jesus? And I remember thinking, you know, you know we're, in, we're in the Philippines. Like, I, this is, like, I'm a part of a multi-generational missionary family to the Philippines. Both my grandparents on both sides uh, are missionaries to the Philippines, went in the 1950s and 60s. Like, we, we've grown up in the church. Like, I've grown up. Last week we talked about serving, and I've grown up serving and, you know, spraying the Lysol everywhere at the club to get the smell of smoke out of the air. Um, you know, I, we, we were just around, you know, the, the church all the time. We were around this good news of Jesus all the time. We were around the gospel. I had been in so many Sunday school classes. I could have told you everything about it. But how many of you know that you don't actually become a Christian just because you're born into a Christian family? Like you actually, the only way you become a Christian is if you decide to let Jesus save you. And so my dad, he asked me, Rob, have you ever made that decision to, to follow Jesus? And I'm like, no, I, I haven't. And so he's like, would you like to do that? I'm like, yeah, I'm in. I mean, it's, it seems great. And, you know, the reason I believe that there was a father in heaven who loved me is because I had a dad here on earth who loved me. And he was just such a model for me where he just showed me who Jesus was. He was the same man on stage and off stage. And it was, I, I just trusted him. And so I believed what he said when he introduced me to Jesus. And so that day, I became a Christian. I became a follower of Jesus. Cut to middle school. Uh, we moved from Manila, Philippines to Springfield, Missouri, the seventh largest city in the world to the third largest city in Missouri. And, um, <laughs> you know, we were just talking about bad, like, fashion trends that we were all about. In middle school, I really embraced, like, the choker necklaces, you know. Didn't have a jawline for it, I'll tell you that much. Uh, but loved the choker necklaces. I was also big into the puka shell game, you know. That was kind of a fun thing. Is that coming back? Is it back? Good news. Should have kept those things, man. Um, have you seen Outer Banks? Um, only the first season. I haven't, just, not at all. Um, I'm a Christian. I don't watch that stuff. All right, guys? Come on. But I'm in middle school, and I remember I'm, I'm laying in bed one night. I fall asleep, and I start having this dream. And this dream was me on a boat, and then my f- whole family's on another boat, and we're just kind of like floating parallel down the line. And eventually, my boat veers off this way, and my family's boat veers off this way. And I just knew, when you, you know, have dreams, and you just kind of know, like it sounds kind of vague, but you know what's happening in those dreams. I just knew, for some reason, I just felt that, man, me and my boat, we were going away from my family for eternity in hell, and my family was going away from me in eternity in heaven, and I woke up in a cold sweat, and I did what maybe you've done before, where I threw up an SOS prayer to God, and I said, God, uh, I don't know if I'm saved, if I'm saved, if I'm not saved, just please save me now. Okay, good night. And I probably had this dream like dozens of times, and I woke up, and I probably did this maybe like a hundred times, where I was just like, God, if I'm not saved, please save me. God, I'm not, I just, I don't know for sure if I'm not, if that last one didn't take two nights ago, I'm going to make sure right now, okay, God, just save me, save me if I'm not saved. God, save me if I'm not saved. Have you guys ever done that? Have you prayed that prayer, the SOS prayer in the middle of the night? And I just got so nervous, like I, I would kind of walk around, I felt so insecure about like my position with God, and so, you know, I, finally, one day, I just worked up the courage to ask my dad, I said, dad, I've got to tell you about what's going on in my life. And I told him that I was like, I just, I just don't know for certain if I'm saved. Have you ever been there? You know, making a decision to ask Jesus to save you, then maybe it's a year later, maybe it's a couple years later, maybe you're like me and you got saved when you were in elementary school and then in middle school you kind of just like start to have these doubts. Maybe you've woken up in the middle of the night with a cold sweat wondering, if it really took, if I said the right things, if I like figured out the formula to make sure beyond a shadow of a doubt if you're saved. 
And so tonight, we're continuing in this series called Fortified, and we're going to talk about this idea of can you be certain that you are saved? Can you be certain that you're a Christian? Can you be certain that if you died tonight, that you would go to heaven and not hell? And so tonight, I just want to tell you a little bit about the conversation my dad had with me when I was a middle schooler. And we're going to open up the scriptures, and I want to let you guys know some good news on the front end. Just on the front end, here's kind of the headline. Um, you can actually be certain that you are saved. You can know that you know that you know that you're saved. You, if, if you've experienced these doubts, you could actually walk out of here secure and planted and sure that God's got you. You know, everything we know about God, everything, everything that we know about God, uh, God is because God has chosen to reveal that to us. Like everything, we don't just make up stuff about God that, and we just hope it to be true. The reason, what we talk about every single week is stuff that God has actually revealed to us and that has been recorded in the scriptures. And so if we know that, if the only way to know who God is and what he has done and what he expects and what he offers to us, the only way for us to know that is stuff because of what God has chosen to reveal to us. So the question then is, what is the key to knowing for sure that you have eternal life? What is the key? So tonight I just have three points for us today. And these are really basic. You probably know these things. But can I just tell you, in the moments of doubt that you have, you need to keep going back to the foundation. You need to keep going back to the basics. You need to always keep going back to the person who handles your salvation. So the first point that I have for you today that you need to know if you want to be secure and be fortified is this, is that Jesus is the key to eternal life. Jesus is the key to eternal life. You know, the Bible makes it clear there are two types of people in this world, okay? There are people who will spend their eternity in heaven, and there are people who will spend their eternity in hell. So what is, what is going to change your direction from going uh, to, from hell to heaven? And the Bible is really clear about this. And this is really simple. But here's what, it, here's what it is. We talked about this in week one, just kind of an overview of the gospel. But in order to go to heaven to be, to, to be saved by God, it's to accept the free gift of salvation from God through Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the Savior who came to set us free from the bondage of sin, the stuff that trips you up, that ties you down, that hurts you, that hurts the people around you, the stuff that you don't tell anyone about, that's the stuff that causes you to go to hell. But Jesus came to pay for that stuff so that you could go to heaven. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, it's like one of the most famous passages. If you've been around here, you know, we, try to, we talk about this a lot. And it, it says this, if, if you want the, the prescription on how to get saved by God, it's, it's this, it's if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. That's it. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one, is, one confesses and is saved. To put it like even simpler terms to like an ABC, uh, for first one A, you just have to admit that you're a sinner. God can't save people who doesn't want to be saved. Like, if you don't think you have anything wrong in your life, God cannot do anything for you. He can only help the people who want him to help. So you have to admit that you're a sinner. The second thing, you have to actually believe in Jesus. You have to, like, act, not just know Jesus, believe in Jesus. To, like, believe what he did. And then third, to confess Jesus as Lord. It's this simple. Sometimes we overcomplicate the gospel. We overcomplicate the good news of Jesus. But we have to to have this as the bedrock of our salvation. It's only through Jesus. He's the only way. But here's the thing. As a middle schooler, I knew that. I knew that. Like, I've been to Sunday school many times. Like, I've, I've grown up in church. I've probably been to more church services than all of you guys. 
like going around to different churches all the time in like multiple services back to back to back. But I like I, I'm churched out. Like I I'm I'm a, I love I'm a church I love church. I'm one of those weird people who are like when I come home from here I'll probably watch a couple church services online because I just love it. I'm weird. My wife is, doesn't get it. Um, when we go on vacation I'll tell like I'll be like hey we can hit up this church on Saturday night and then we go this church on Sunday. She goes or we could just go on vacation. You know I'm like no but we've got to maximize this stuff. Um, but like if it was if it was knowing all this stuff then why did I experience this doubt? Why did I keep throwing up these SOS 911 prayers, God, if I'm not saved, please save me. God, if I'm not saved, please save me. God, if I'm not saved, please save me. I knew that Jesus was the only way. That wasn't my problem. My problem was I wasn't sure that I did the right thing to ensure that I was going to heaven when I died. I just didn't, I'm like, I know this is the truth. I know that, but did I figure it out? Did I say the right prayer on the ABC? Did I, did I do that formula well? Like, what do I need to do? And so the second point tonight that we need to do, if, if you're in here and you need to secure your salvation, to be certain that God has you, is you need to know that assurance comes from the promises of God. Assurance comes from the promises of God. Um, on September 30th, 1982, six people died in Chicago because they consumed extra strength Tylenol. And a panic ensued all throughout the nation, really, um, as the company Johnson & Johnson, the, the kind of the over, this over Tylenol, tried to figure out what was going on, what had happened. And what had happened was some person or persons had, in the Chicago area, had dipped certain Tylenol in cyanide, and they put it back, and people in the suburbs of Chicago were taking it, and then people were just dropping like flies, and we, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what was going on. And the leaders of Johnson & Johnson, um, the creator of Tylenol, they were working with the government and the FBI to try to figure out a game plan of like what is going on. And so they isolated the outbreak just to Chicago. And so the government, they said, hey, um, you know, because the, the, uh, Johnson Johnson was, do we need to recall everything? Like, do we need to pull, like, every piece of Tylenol off the shelves? They're like, you don't need to do that. But I would say you just, there's no, out, there's no reports of outbreaks anywhere else. Um, you only need to pull the Tylenol from the Chicago area. Because here's the deal, guys. If the cost of removing all of the Tylenol throughout America was $100 million dollars. Like, they were just going to take a $100 million hit, and the government and the FBI said, you don't have to do it, you just have to recall the ones from Chicago. And Johnson & Johnson decided that their number one priority was the people. And so what they did is they recalled every piece of Tylenol in the entire country, and it cost them $100 million dollars. Their stock value went from, you know, pretty good to zero in a second. People, like experts in branding and marketing and, and, and you know, corporate stuff were saying, Tylenol's dead. Like, you can't be the, the thing that kills people. Like, you're going to have to start over, rebrand. But here's what happened. What happened was so interesting. Because Tylenol did all these things, they started to immediately work with the FDA to develop some brand new, um, uh, brand new tamper-proof packaging, which included these foil seals and other features that made it obvious to the consumers that if there was tampering that took place. And these packaging protections soon, and like in the height of this stuff, this soon became like industry standard. And something amazing happened. Their stock price went from zero to up a little bit, to up a little bit, to up a little bit. And eventually, they rested at a much higher place than they ever were before this huge tragedy. Extra, experts say they were never going to recover from this. Yet Tylenol, you probably have Tylenol in your house right now. Now, what was, the, what was one of the keys that saved this brand from total destruction? 
the reason they did this, the reason they took this hit, the reason it cost them so much is because they wanted, even though the outbreak was in Chicago, they wanted someone in California to not even have to wonder if this was tempered, tampered with. They wanted them, all the consumers of this product who they were here to serve to know for sure there is no problem with this. They wanted them to know for sure, and the public responded. And Tylenol, now organizations that go through crisis, they actually all look at Tylenol and Johnson & Johnson to figure out how to manage in a crisis. You know, God, he wants us to be secure of our salvation. You know, while spiritual growth and, and good works and obedience and, you know, to, to God's word are evidence of your salvation, you should not base your assurance on those things. What you should base your confidence on should come from what God's word tells us it should come from. So what does God's word promise about salvation to you? What are some of the promises that we can cling to as people who are trying to follow Jesus? What are some of those things that would help us to, to be certain, to know? Just like Johnson & Johnson, like, we, we, like a tamper-free salvation. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Let me read to you in 1 John 5, 11 through 13. And it says this, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. It's pretty simple. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may, what does that say? What does that say? No, that you have eternal life. God is the giver of eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. And whoever has the son has eternal life. If you have the son, you have eternal life. If you have Jesus, you have eternal life. This is, this is the gospel. Like this is the good news about Jesus. The good news of Jesus, it's simple and it's straightforward it's hard sometimes to wrap our minds around, but it's simple enough for a child to even respond to it. And listen, you don't have to worry and fret about your salvation because God wants you to know that you have eternal life. He wants you to be sure because of the promises of God. You know, um, I don't know if you have people that you go out to eat with that love to pay. Um, it's awesome to go out to, to eat with people who love to pay for you. Um, my dad is one of those people who, like, when we go out to eat, he's always trying to pay. And I'm always trying to, like, fight him off. But he always somehow manages to do it. And, um, and it's, uh, it's one of those things where I'm always just like, thanks, Dad. I appreciate it. You shrug your shoulders. You're like, thanks. Um, but, you know, w my dad has never offered to pay for our dinner and then not done it. You know what I'm saying? Like my dad, my dad, he always, he always, when he says he's going to do it, um, he does it. And I'll be like, dad, 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 no, I, I spent, I splurged. I got Dr. Pepper instead of water. You know, like, <laughs> if you, growing up, you know, you look at your parents and be like, am I getting soda today? Nope, cool. Um, does it come with the kids meal? Nope, all right, we're good. Like, I'm like, dad, I, 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 I like got this, I got this expensive plate. And he's, he's always like, no, 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 I got it, I got it. It's, it's on me, it's on me. And not one time has my dad said, Rob, I got it, to where then he said, oh, it turns out I don't got it. <laughs> I'm sorry, boy. Uh, don't. He's never once done that. And you know why? It's because my, it's twofold. My dad, he's motivated to pay for me because he loves me. He loves me. And the second reason that he's able to do it is because he has the means to do it. He's able to pay for me. He can afford it. And this is the same that's true with our God. God is motivated to save you because he loves you. He loves you. Like, may we never get, like, too old to, to be, like, wrecked by the fact that God loves us. He loves us. And not only that, he has enough resources to pay for you. 
He has enough resources to pay. And in fact, he's already paid for you. That's like if you're trying to get the check and you go over to the waiter and said, the bill's already been covered. Like before you even get to the awkward, I'll pay. No, the, the bill's been taken care of. That's the way we are with our sin in our life. If you want to be forgiven by God, the bill's been paid. You just have to accept it. You have to acknowledge it. You have to, thank you, Jesus. I, I couldn't afford that. Thank you so much. There's, I don't really have anything else to say. I don't have anything to contribute. Thank you. This is what God wants to do for us. God promises that if you believe in Jesus, you are saved. His credit card isn't going to bounce. And some of you may have not known God for very long, but can I tell you that God is trustworthy? He's trustworthy. His track record is spotless. He has never told someone that he will save them and then not save them. He's good for it. Titus 1-2 is like this amazing beginning to this letter, but in this beginning of this letter, it says this, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. God never lies. Like, that's hard for us to compute because we, we live in a world where, like, you can never totally trust everybody's word all the time. Even people we, we'd held in high regard, it turns out sometimes they lie. God, he's incapable of lying. So if God says, you can know for sure that I have you, he's not lying. He can't do it. He is only truth. He's only love. He is on, like, this is who God is. Like We have to just understand and trust that God is going to do it by holding on to his promises, to trust that he's good for it, and to trust that he's not lying to you. He's not lying to you. Jesus is, is the only way to eternal life. Assurance has come from the promises of God. And number three, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it's awesome. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If you are in Christ, like you're new, you may not feel it, like, you don't have to clean yourself up before you get to God. When you get to God, God will make you new. He'll, he puts a new heart in you. He, get, he transforms you. He brings you from death to light. We sang the song, this is my testimony, from death to life. This is all of our testimonies. This is all that we have. This change comes from the power of God working within us to be more like Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We're kind of flying a bunch of different verses tonight. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that anyone can boast. When you get saved by God and you meet Jesus and he saves you, you become different. You become a new creation. And when I, when I talked to my dad as a middle schooler, he asked me a couple questions. And these questions really, like, help shape my response towards this uncertainty that I had about my salvation. He asked me just, like, straight up, he goes, well, Rob, and what's, what's awesome, my dad just, like, he responded with such gentleness in this moment. He's like, I was so nervous he was going to be like, you, I, you, we figured this out, dude. <laughs> like, I'm a pastor. Like, you can't, I can't be, you know, around this. You got to figure it out and come back to me. He didn't do that. He's like, well, well well, Rob, have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Have you done it? I was like, yeah. I've, I've asked him to forgive me. Um, he said, hey, Rob, do you, do, you, um, do you feel like any evidence of salvation? Like the stuff that we talked about, like this new creation stuff? He's like, do you feel bad when you sin? Do you feel like this conviction that comes on you when you sin? I'm like, yeah, I, I feel that. I feel that. And he said, well, Rob, my, my third question is, if, if, that, if that's the case and you, and you ask Jesus to save you, you know he's the only, only way, and then there, you experience like some of like the result of being saved, um, my third question for you is, do you trust that Jesus is actually going to do it? Do you trust that he's actually going to do what he says you're going to do? And I called my dad. Um, a couple days ago, and we talked about it, because he was, he, he was going to talk with another guy who had the same issue, and I, I reminded him of the story. I'm like, Dad, do you remember when you helped me? 
And so we, we just started talking about that. And, and my dad told me, you know, he's like, you know, on one side you have this doubt. And on the other side you have this certainty that some people talk about. And there's a gap a lot of times that we live in. And I, I really do believe so many Christians live this gap too long. It's not bad to doubt. It's not bad to experience some of these things. It is bad to live in that because there's more for us. In 1 John, like, you, we wrote this so that you know. And in the gap between doubt and certainty is faith. It's faith. It's to believe it. You know, there's this famous clip from this pastor, Alex, Alexander Begg, or Alistair Begg, and where he, he talks about um, how it's so important to constantly remind ourselves and preach to ourselves about the cross of Jesus. So, to, to, you know, remind ourselves that, that it's because of the cross of Jesus that we're saved. He says, if you don't always remind yourself of the cross of Jesus, then we will revert always to a faith plus works salvation. And this, this looks like, man, God, I, I'm like 90% like sure that you're going to, that you save me, but just in case, I'm going to be good. Like, I'm going to not cuss on Tuesdays and Sundays. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to like give of my time, my talent, my treasure. I'm just going to like, between you and me, dog, we're good. Like, we got this thing on wrap. And we, this is kind of what you, that's, that sounds stupid, but this is kind of what we do. Like, we revert to this stuff. Like, our hearts are so prone to wander. They're so prone to do the things that we never, God would never ask us to do. And so he, he said that we've got to preach the cross to us all the time. And he said, um, he said, if you ask that question that we've asked before, if you, were to, if you were to die tonight and you get to heaven's gates, why should they let you in? And what he said was interesting. He said, if you answer that question with the first person and you say, because I, because I did, because I accepted, because I did all these things, then you're, wrong. you're missing it. Because the only proper answer to that question is in the third person. Why should you get in? Because he, because he saved me. Because he, he gave everything for me. He died on a cross for me. Like I ima can't imagine um, that, that guy on the cross next to, uh, next to Jesus, the thief on the cross next to him, where Jesus told him, hey, you're going to be with me in paradise. Can you imagine how confused that thief must have been when he showed up to heaven? Can you imagine the angel, like he never went to a Bible study. He never went to church. He never, he never did all this stuff, but he just, he made it. He made it. Can you imagine an angel coming in and being like, why are you here? I don't know. I don't know why I'm here. And I'm, Alistair Beck says, I'm sure, like it sounds like, I wonder if like the, the angel had to go to his supervisor angel, be like, hey, come in here. We got a, we got a hard case. Uh, what do we do? And then the supervisor angel goes, um, what's your position on the justification uh, by faith alone? He's like, I don't know. Um, he's like, what's your, what's your position on the doctrine of scripture? Are we good on that? He's like, never. I don't even know what that is. He's like, well, then why are you here? And he looks at him and says, because the man on the middle cross said I could come. That's the only reason why I'm here. And that's the only reason why any of us will ever get to heaven. Because Jesus, who died on the cross for us, said that we can come, that we can be there. You know, this is the only answer. If you don't constantly tell yourself and preach to yourself and remind yourself that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is the only reason why that you can be certain that you're, you're saved, you will never be certain. Because you will revert to faith plus works, and when you have anything to do with your salvation, there will be uncertainty with it. The only way to be certain that God has you is to remember that God has you. He can't lie. If, if he has drawn you to himself and you've reached out and you've been saved by Jesus, he's not going to let go. You're secure. You can be secure tonight. 
You can leave today not ever having to pray that 911 prayer ever again. And you can just rest in God's ability to manage your salvation. And guys, when you do this, when I, when I started doing this, guys, man, the weight just lifted. And I was like, God, you, thank you. Again, you don't really have anything else to say, but th- thank you. And you, get in, you, get, you sing in these, in these moments like this, and you're just like, thank you, God. Like, I didn't deserve any of this. I didn't do anything to, to get this. You saved me. And the reason I can be secure now and I know have a home in heaven is because you can't lie. And you love me. And you able, you're able to pay for me. You have paid for me. Everything's going to be okay. I want to read one last scripture for you to show that God is aware of you and that he has went to save you. It says this, Jesus is talking to his disciples in John 14. It says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. All of you guys are invited. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you myself. That is where I'm going. That is, that is where I am you may also be also. And you know the way that I'm going. And Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. Amen, Thomas. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So my final thought today for you is he, you can be certain about your salvation when you trust that Jesus will do what he says. You can be certain about your salvation when you trust that Jesus will do what he says. Will you pray with me?